Hello and welcome everyone. In this video, I'm going to talk about allocation mechanisms, which basically answers the question of who gets that which has been produced. All right, and again, here is my dog. This is just to create the thumbnail on my desktop uh, once I save this file, so don't, you don't need to worry about that. Here is the main reference for th this lecture, especially for the examples. This is uh, Michael Sandel's uh, What Money Can't Buy, so The Moral Limits of Markets. Another, so you could find that book here, right? So really interesting book, especially if you're interested in the area of ethics and economic behavior, as is the goal of the course, and if you're interested in like morality and markets more generally. So there's a lot of philosophers, economists, and kind of thinkers in these areas writing kind of inter interdisciplinary stuff that's really interesting. Another book that I don't rest on directly for these slides, though has influenced my reasoning, is uh, Jay Brennan and Peter Jaworski's book, uh, Markets Without Limits. And so it's another interesting one. Jay was at uh, Arizona, and we overlapped a little bit, though Jay's PhD is in philosophy, mine is in econ. I'm not sure, I'm not sure Jay would recognize me. We were in a class that uh, Dave Schmitz had taught. Dave Schmitz is um, one, of the, uh, one of the philosophers that I cite for a lot of the philosophy in the class. So anyway, uh, we face choices when allocating things of value, right? Goods and services, houses and food, jobs, medical residency, school enrollments, performances, such as season ticket holder versus general admission, right? We've got a lot of different things that are of value and we've got to determine who is going to be able to consume these things. And with each of these, there's kind of different levels of necessity and scarcity is entering in different sorts of ways, right? That's relevant for how we think about how, how allocation of these things ought to go. We've got a lot of different choices between ways that we can determine who gets that which has been produced. Could be by government decree, right? You could have a central planner, you could have a centralized economy. Typically, you think of that in like a command or communist type system. We could just do a first come first served mechanism. And that happens actually kind of a lot of places, especially if there's a shortage. Could have a lottery, could have an auction, could just have standard markets, or you could have things that are kind of in between. So for instance, during the pandemic, a lot of, a lot of retailers would place a limit on some of the necessities that you could buy. So for instance, if you wanted to buy milk, you might be limited to two items of milk or two gallons or two cartons or whatever. Some of them had their definition of, uh, that's why I said item, some of them had their definition a little bit different than others, such that, you know, maybe the limit would be like two things of milk and you could either walk away with like a, a quart or you could, or two quarts, or you could walk away with two gallons. And so if you really needed milk, I guess you'd walk away with the two gallons. Uh, anyway, so there'd, you know, be maybe some limits on how much you'd be able to be purchased. That would take place at the retailer level. In the backdrop, this would be a market system still. But anyway, you could think of different type, types of circumstances where you'd have some combination of these or typically based maybe you know in markets and then maybe some type of regulation on top. But the basic idea is like we've got a lot of different ways we can determine who's able to consume things. And very often we realize that there's flaws with the way that things are allocated. And so my comment here is, well, with a lot of these, there's Firstly, no guarantee the resources get directed to those who value them the most. That's kind of the main problem with first come, first serve. In some sense, depending on what it is, this might not seem directly unfair. So if it's the type of thing where everybody knows when the item is going to go on sale and then you can choose to camp out the night before and then be first in line, and if you decide to sort of bear, bear that cost of your time, then in some sense you're paying in a very real sense you're paying with something other than money perhaps uh, maybe time maybe money if you're foregoing wages think about whatever is the next highest alternative use of your time but anyway so first come first serve doesn't necessarily have to be inherently unfair but if it's the type of thing where you don't know that there's a shortage and that they have defaulted to a first come first serve like once we run out we run out type of mechanism uh, then there might be a little bit, a little bit more inequality introduced. Could have a lottery, 
Well, I mean, that's not necessarily going to guarantee that resources go to those who care the most about them, but everybody presumably has the same equally bad chance at winning the lottery, right? Uh, could allocate via edict or central planner by government decree? That doesn't seem very good because this place, I mean, the big problem now is government would need to have quite a lot of information to be able to determine where, who, you know, where things ought to go. And so that's where inefficiency enters with central planning. Well, with some of these other alternatives that I had enumerated, there's less of a concern over efficiency, more of a concern over equality. So uh, with in the case of auction or in the case of markets, these should be relatively efficient mechanisms under pretty standard assumptions. We might worry about equality in those case, in some of those cases though. All right, so as a society, we've generally decided to allocate many things via markets. Certainly that's true in the United States and true in many other places. Markets tend to be the way that we end up allocating scarce resources. So then we might reflect though, firstly, is there a moral way to deal with scarcity? Does, does a moral way to deal with scarcity exist? Are markets being one way to deal with scarcity, are markets th themselves moral? Or are they amoral? Are they immoral, right? And when do markets work well and when do they fail to work well? Well, when markets work well, we say we've got efficiency. When they fail to work well, we've got inefficiency. I mean, often markets perform very well. Often that's the case, right? So when do they perform well? Well, under this assumptions of perfect competition, right? If we have a perfectly competitive market, we're gonna maximize efficiency as measured by the sum of consumer and producer surplus. So markets tend to perform very well, meaning markets tend to be efficient. We could get market failure, right? And this does happen, right? We can get inefficiency introduced. This is where the market fails to produce the efficient result on its own. So when does this happen? Well, the causes of market failure are like market power. So think of like monopoly in the case of a single seller or monopsony in the case of a single buyer. Also, you can get market failure if there's uh, information asymmetry. So we get our kind of problems of asymmetric information, in particular, adverse selection and moral hazard. Or, and or, we can get market failure when there's externalities. So if there's an additional benefits or harms that affect bystanders, apart from whatever is the activity that's generating the externalities as a byproduct. So. These are kind of the key main causes of market failure. And so these are situations where markets left to their own devices will be inefficient. So that's a reason to be a little bit suspicious of markets. Even so, we might still prefer markets because despite rampant imperfect information or imperfect, <laughs> rampant imperfect information and imperfect competition actually, uh, market-based prices do a better job of coordinating economic activity than say a central planner would. So this is kind of harkening back to Adam Smith's invisible hand. So the idea you can think of market constructed prices, market based prices, market created prices as like the conductor of an orchestra, like kind of keeping everybody on kind of on the same page. And in some sense, the, the information that's captured and being reflected through market prices is really all we need to coordinate economic activity under a lot of circumstances, even if there's imperfect competition, meaning somebody's got some market power, and even if there's not perfect information, market prices would do a better job under most of those cases than would the central planner. Why? Well, it's an information story. The central planner just simply wouldn't have all the information about the signals that otherwise would have been captured in market constructed prices, right? Market constructed prices are saying everything about how much consumers want of the particular item, everything about how much it's costing per to produce those items, and then more besides. It's bringing these together into determining where the equilibrium would be. That's a tall order for a central planner to be able to achieve. Uh, also, markets are super important for freedom, right? the ability for buyers to find sellers, sellers to find buyers, and to be able to determine what to do with their resources and for entrepreneurship, that's super important. All right, so there's another key assumption though that we might overlook and might realize maybe to this point in the lecture, you're thinking, well, okay, markets are 
good, but there's some bad things about markets too. And you know, what about the inequality or, or these sorts of things that you know I kind of mentioned a little bit earlier? Well, one key assumption we might fail to pay attention to when it comes to thinking about the workings of markets is the decoupling potentially between ability to pay and willingness to pay, right? So think back to like principles of econ, think about the demand curve. The height of the demand curve measured the willingness to pay, the marginal benefit for that particular item. So the marginal benefit associated with producing a particular quantity, or if we're talking about the individual demand curve, the the height of the demand curve correspond to the consumer's willingness to pay for that item. That should be natural, actually, if you think about the, cons the calculation of consumer surplus, right? Consumer surplus is just the area under the demand curve, above the market price, typically a triangle, right? One half base times height. Well, consumer surplus is capturing the difference between willingness to pay and then the actual price paid aggregated up throughout the market. Okay, good. That works when willingness to pay and ability to pay are gonna be pretty much the same thing. But what if they're decoupled? What if they're not the same, right? So then we could end up having a problem where resources aren't directed to those who value them the highest. Resources are directed to those who are able to pay the most for them. And that could be a really serious problem, right? You could think of different types of examples where this would be the case. So, you know, you're, you've, gone for, you've gone for a hike in the desert, think of like, Arizona or did grad school go for a hike in, in Tucson. There's kind of a famous hiking area, Sabino Canyon on the northeast side of town. Or I don't know, maybe you're in Phoenix area and you're hiking on Camelback or whatever is the case. And you come down and you get to the parking lot and there's a vending machine there. And you, you go up to it and uh, it, it turns out you're really thirsty. You didn't bring enough water. You forgot Arizona gets dry and you're going to need to buy some uh, refreshments as soon as possible. So you go to the vending machine. It turns out, you know, you don't have any money on you. Maybe you forgot your wallet, whatever is the case. Hopefully you didn't lose it on the trail, <laughs> whatever's going on. Uh, there is maybe one bottle of water left and you're not going to get it. So you're going to have to go and, I don't know, go, go to your car, try to search through the, through the seats, maybe try to ask people for money. Meanwhile, somebody else walks up and you know, they've got their, they've got their camelback pouch and they're ready to go on their hike. And you know, they're, they've got plenty of water. Or maybe they're just even just kind of sightseeing around the parking lot, which is itself scenic, whatever the case may be. And they run up to the vending machine, plop in their two bucks, and then they get their, they get the last bottle of water. Well, they had the ability to pay under those circumstances. They might not have valued that bottle of water as much as you being super thirsty. And so there we've got inefficiency. We've got a market, but we've got inefficiency because they had the ability to pay and you didn't. Although their valuation much, might, might be much closer to what they actually paid, whereas your valuation for that bottle of water might have been you know, 10, 20, maybe if you're thirsty enough, it's Arizona after all, maybe $100, who knows? Right, so that's a problem. Now, apart from my kind of, apart from my kind of silly example, we could think of kind of worse circumstances where you could think of, well, we've got income inequality. So, what if we have items that people need or would desire and they simply can't afford, right? And so now we've got a problem, both in terms of uh, the inefficient or in terms of the inequality that's present, but also kind of the key reason for one of the key reasons, kind of the key defenses of markets is efficiency. And if that fails to hold, now you've got inefficiency in addition to inequality, which is, you know, kind of two bad things. So, all right. Here's some other additional examples we might sort of explore now thinking about kind of issues with allocation mechanisms and issues with markets more generally. All right. So here's an example. So, uh, we can think of line standing and line cutting. So Southwest Airlines offers a $15 early bird check-in. So for you know one way, pay $15 for the way back, uh, which often helps the buyer claim a better seat. Matter of fact, I do this. I like to get my early bird check-in because there is one seat by the exit row that has nobody in front of it. So you get quite a bit of leg room. And I really actually kind of need that seat because I typically will do a long run before I 
b- before I fly because if I'm traveling, might not be able to run very far. And so I do a long run the day of or the day before so my legs are usually sore. So I want quite a lot of leg room. All right, so you can buy, maybe lay claim to a better seat. Okay, uh, British Airways allowed a fast track to jump the queue at passport and immigration checkpoints. Uh, United Airways allowed a $39 fee to cut the line at security. Uh, as we're reflecting on these, they feel different, right? There might be something importantly different about these examples. I don't know. What do you think? So uh, some people might worry that whereas maybe it doesn't seem that bad that somebody could pay the extra $15 to presumably get on the airplane a little bit quicker. Who knows? I mean, they got if the first one on the airplane means you're sitting on it for longer. So I don't know if that's that great of a deal anyway, unless you get that seat that I was talking about. Maybe I should edit that out of this video. Um, anyway, so... Uh, we might worry, though, that security is a matter of national defense and it should be something that should be kind of shared evenly uh, rather than as an amenity that ought to be for sale. And so we might be a little, maybe, maybe we don't feel so good about these last couple. I don't know. Everybody's a little bit different. You might think about these differently than, uh, than, than me or uh, other, other people. But seems like, at least on the face of it, there's something different between those examples. And we kind of want to get to the heart of what this is. There's an amusement park example as well. So Universal Studios Hollywood. Well, if you pay double admission, you can go to the front of the line. All right, seems pretty good. Uh, also, sometimes places that do this establish separate gates for VIP access to avoid upsetting other customers, which I think is just awesomely terrible, right? On one hand, um, you know this is something that's not going to sit well. I mean, you're thinking about you're waiting in lines. These are long lines. It might be hot, right, in Hollywood. That's Los Angeles, um, Southern California. And people don't take kindly to other people cutting the line. And so here you're realizing this. And I don't know if this is, who knows, I shouldn't say this is Universal Studios that's actually doing this. Maybe some amusement parks, maybe it's not as hot as, I don't know, who knows. But the very fact that you'd have a separate gate to avoid upsetting other customers seems to indicate that you might be suspecting there's at least some of an issue here. So <laughs> my reflection, well, does this hidden access make this better or worse? I mean, in one sense, it seems underhanded. In another, I don't know, maybe I'd rather not know that wealthier people were getting different treatment, right? Like the way as I was explaining this, it seems not so good to, to hide the secret entrance for those paying extra. On the other hand, I don't know, if I'm waiting in line for a long time, I think it's probably for my own good, conditional on them letting people in ahead of me that I don't know about it, right? I would rather not, I honestly, I would rather not if, if I'm in a line that's taking forever, I would rather not know that it's because other people were paying to get in front of me. <clears throat> All right, so here's a driving example. So we have carpool lanes for high op- occupancy vehicles. You can often pay a fee or a fine to ride as an individual, right? So if you ride in the HOV lane or if you ride in you know, the carpool lane, and sometimes you pay, a fee, you pay a fee to be allowed to do this. So there's one of these... I'm getting the, I think it's 470 around Denver and there's some other places you go and pay the fee for this lane. In other cases, you jump in there as an individual and run the risk of being pulled over and paying a fine, right? Uh, there's an interesting example from Curb Your Enthusiasm where um, Larry David hires someone to help Larry David get to the LA Dodgers game quicker, right? So you think of the different sorts of ways that people try to get around uh, the high occupancy uh, uh, lane. As I was mentioning this, thinking about fines and thinking about fees, right? I mean, it seems there's a major difference between fees, or seems the major difference between fines and fees is the moral disapproval associated with fines, right? Fees seem to imply no moral content. It's just a price. It's just an additional fee. You might, you might think it's wrong to have to pay an additional fee. I remember at University of Arizona, students had to pay an, ex, an additional $25. I think got raised to $50 to fund the recreation center. And I would go there because I realized this gym is just a way better deal 
for me to go as a student than like anything else in my entire life. If you were to sign up for a, a, a gym membership, it's way more expensive than what it would be if it's if it's at if if you're you know a student at the university. Why? Well, University of Arizona during that time I think was forty to forty five thousand students, and forty to forty five thousand students were not going to campus rec. Right? I would recognize. I'd go there. I would try to get everybody else's money's worth. So I'd go there frequently, and there is regulars that I'd, I'd recognize. But if I were to add up all the people that I recognized over, I don't know, several years, and then all the people that I didn't, I wouldn't imagine that there is much more than five, ten thousand people going, and that's a high estimate. I would imagine it's probably a lot lower. Uh, all right, so. But so we might not think that it's so good that university is doing this because a lot of people aren't using it. But if we're just thinking about it just in terms of a fee, though, the fee itself has no moral content. You know, it's just a price. You know, however, if you're paying a fine, right, fines are sort of explicitly a sanction and sometimes with substantial moral implications. Right. If you're paying a fine, you've done something wrong to incur this fine. Here's my example. So I was parking in downtown Grand Rapids. So my, my um, here's the example. So my, my brother's law office is, uh, is downtown Grand Rapids and they had just moved to that location and they're having you know people together and we're kind of hanging out and I had I'd parked down below and there's a restaurant down below. I'd parked there right on the street, and I never, I didn't, I didn't give it a thought. I, we, we, wrote, we arrived, you know, kind of in the afternoon. They're kind of getting settled in, and then, uh, you know, a little bit later in the evening, kind of getting about dinner time or so. I think it might have been like six or, or or seven or something like this. It kind of came up that oh, you know, you don't want to park real close because you'll you'll get a ticket. And at the time, I I realized, you know, I hadn't parked there on purpose, but now I was there. And if I was going to move my car anywhere else, the, there was no close parking. And so I figured, well, um, I might get a ticket. Uh, but if I, if I go down and you know, move my car, I'm definitely going to be pretty far away. It's going to be dark. And I don't know downtown very that well. And I didn't want to be walking that far. And I didn't want to actually kind of waste the time away from everybody else because we gonna, weren't gonna, it wasn't going to be a late night anyway. And so... I decided to just leave my car there. I came down, I think it's like eight o'clock or something. And when I came down to see my car, some people were walking by and they're like, uh, there, there's a couple, couple couples and I could overhear what they were saying. And one of them was like, Oh, that sucks. And then somebody else like loud enough for me to hear was like, says no parking after 5 PM. Like, you know, what are you like? What are you doing? And at that point I was thinking, I mean, all right, I'm not happy about this ticket but on the other hand i'd rather pay the 25 dollars than to have gone down and moved my car and so in some sense from my perspective the 25 dollars was just the price to park there and it was actually a better deal than having to park legally somewhere else um, even so as i'm thinking about this inspecting my own moral character right there's something about this that makes us, even me, a little bit uncomfortable with this type of reasoning. You know, it's not the type, I, w I wouldn't do it again, but well, I don't know. I wouldn't, if I was going to, if I was going to do the whole thing over again and I had known that you couldn't park there, I probably would have found a further, a, a, a parking spot, a perfectly legal parking spot somewhere else. Uh, and it would have actually been relatively close at three o'clock in the afternoon. At Faced with the same circumstances, at eight o'clock at night, realizing that there's nowhere close to park and I might get a $25 ticket, I'd probably just take the $25 ticket. I mean, the legal parking was probably $10, maybe $15, depends if there's an event. I don't know. So anyway, so then, our, then, then the question I want to reflect it on is, apart from fines and fees, does placing a price on something create additional costs, right? So here's the example, Shakespeare in the Park from Central Park, New York City. Um, tickets are offered free from the nonprofit New York City Public Theater for a 1 p.m. show. 
people are waiting in line for hours or they could pay somebody else to stay and stand in their place, right? $125 a ticket, um, maybe for having somebody being a line stander. And ultimately there's some people not so happy with this, uh, this practice of paying somebody else to wait in line to get free tickets is argued as not in the spirit of Shakespeare in the park. In particular, Andrew, Andrew Cuomo put pressure on Craigslist to shut down the secondary market for Shakespeare in the park, saying selling tickets are meant, that are meant to be free deprives New Yorkers of enjoying benefits that this taxpayer-supported institution provides. Uh, which is really interesting because while I can be somewhat sympathetic with that view, on the other hand, tickets are going to those who value them most highly. Well, they're putting a price on something where the price was already wrong. Um, and if they would be allocated throughout the traditional way, it's not clear that that would happen. I mean, I suppose those who'd be willing to stand in line and you know follow the first come first serve mechanism, but it has the same criticisms as the first come first serve that I mentioned at the beginning, which is that there's kind of no guarantee that the items are gonna to go to those who would appreciate them the most. Though, why would we worry? Well, maybe at $125 a ticket, we're substantially concerned that we're not having a circumstance where willingness to pay and ability to pay are closely related. All right, so on the other hand, it's a public theater. So it's a gift to the, to the city and maybe paying money in, uh, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe paying money for these tickets is diminishing some important feature, right? Shakespeare in the park is supposed to be a gift to the city. There's maybe like in some public good aspect or, or um, something along those lines. And what's the problem? Well, maybe placing money on this thing that's supposed to be free actually does cheapen it in some sense. All right, so now I wanna reflect kind of on the examples we've got here and then thinking about market efficiency more generally. So we know from principles level econ and from the very beginning, competitive equilibrium gives us the efficient allocation. Uh, we make assumptions about demand, right? Willingness to pay is highly associated with ability to pay. But what if willingness to pay is not a good proxy for ability to pay? What if these are different? And so now we worry that this is gonna introduce not only uh, the sort of equality, inequality concern, but also uh, an inefficiency concern as well. Uh, because you, so the argument for, with markets or argument for markets, one of the strong arguments tends to be, well, market created prices are gonna direct resources to those who value them the most. And this means that we're gonna get the efficient outcome but what if those who value them value the item the most are unable to afford it, right? So another thing I wanna reflect on, another question I wanna pose, and this is kind of a question I wanna actually leave us with after I go to the next slide, which is, is there such a thing as an unfair price? Uh, some last thoughts. So why do some instances of queue jumping and line standing strike us as, as particularly objectionable and others not so much? So we've thought about some of these, some of these examples probably uh, strike you as being super objectionable. Others maybe not as bad, maybe not bad at all. So one of the questions then is, well, maybe before we determine whether markets are appropriate for allocating the good, we ought, to we ought to determine what kind of good it is and then how it ought to be valued. A couple other questions. So for reflection now, does building a market around a good or service change an important feature? Does introducing commerce change create something bad as a result. On the other hand, or is it the case that these goods or services are already themselves things we find objectionable, apart from whether or not commerce is allowed, right? Kind of think about those things. So I actually got kind of three questions for us to reflect on. Does, does allowing a market for some good or service cheapen it? Or do we lose something when that happens? Or is it the case that these are things that shouldn't be for sale in the first place? And then kind of alongside these things, is there such a thing as an unfair price? And kind of think about this. Kind of ask yourself, I mean, you might immediately, your first, your first answer might be an immediate yes or an immediate no. Probably for a lot of people, it's an immediate yes. But kind of think about it a little bit. And think about some of the, you, it, you might not ultimately change your mind as a result, but kind of think about the different layers of this question. It's kind of a lot, actually, seems like a simple question. It's actually not. Kind of, kind of think carefully about is there such a thing as an unfair price? Okay, and then these here. 
All right, so anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. I'm going to go ahead and conclude here, and I'll see you in the next one.